is my studio. This is um, where I, uh, I don't know, where, where, it's where I work, where I am every day. So, yeah. How have you been dealing with this quarantine and all this craziness? It's not that much different for me. Um, you know, it's like I, I pretty much spent most of my time um, hiding out inside anyway. So the only difference is, is I only go grocery shopping once a week and I do it for my parents and um, I don't know. I'm not getting enough exercise, but um, I've actually been really productive. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, That's, that seems to be working out all right. I kind of got lucky, you know, it's like I was really inspired like to start working on a bunch of things um, right when this started. So I'd kind of just come out of a very non-productive um, streak. So, yeah. Well, what kind of stuff have you been working on? Um, been doing the new, my new, a uh, lot of work on my, on the new PIA record. A um, couple dandies tracks have been floating around. Um, those, those seem to move slow, so um, we'll see. Um, let's see, um, I'm helping Jason Adams um, with his record, uh, his sort of solo, not solo record, I guess, I don't know. It's, <laughs> um, so far it's just me and him. Um, he brings in songs and, and we put them together. Um, and then, uh, the project I have with Chris Ollie from Six by Seven that's called Walls of Dada. We've started record number three. So yeah, kind of all over the place. Well, it sounds like it's it's about exactly a year ago. Uh, I saw you guys at the Fillmore, and you were on your 25th anniversary tour. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a year later, things are are much different. And you guys pretty much tour every year, so it must feel weird to to not be on the road and to not be playing shows. Yeah, um, it's, uh, there's all sorts of, of things that aren't happening now. Um, today, actually, we were supposed to be, be uh, playing with the Portland Symphony, um, or the Oregon Symphony, sorry. Um, and we had a whole, you know, hour and a half set of um, our music you know, scored for an orchestra and just the sort of mock-up, you know, with a, a, a like digital orchestra, or whatever, um, just sounded amazing. So that's a little frustrating that that hasn't happened, um, but we'll get there, hopefully. Hopefully it'll be next year. We scheduled this and then I realized that that show was supposed to happen on on today yeah um what, what was how did that come about and and what was the process like for figuring out which songs you wanted to make you know orchestral um it came about from um our the guy that does um uh front of house for us and and helps us a lot with like a bunch of production stuff and um uh, just things like that. Uh, Chris Bergstrom, or Mango, as we call him. Um, he also works, um, he runs a, a sound company in town and that does, uh, brings in the PA for um, the symphony every time they work with, you know, some somebody that's coming through town. And he was wearing one of our shirts. Um, and somebody involved was like, hey, we should do a, we should work with them, and he's like, I can put that together, and so yeah, just started talking, uh, picking the songs. Uh, there was a the conductor we um, and the guy who ended up uh, scoring it. And there's some of them. Uh, they uh, they picked a lot of the songs. Um, but we definitely told them we kind of like to do some of the more, uh, more of the ones that we don't play live all the time. 
um because there's a lot that just i don't know you know 25 years in there's a lot of songs you don't do so the set was going to have a lot of songs that we don't do all the time and you know the the versions of them were going to be kind of radically different so a couple examples or can you give us a um, spoiler alert on on you know a little bit of the set list it's okay nah, if you i mean i i don't want to i mean i i've already posted like some sheet music from nietzsche so that's that's one of them that was the first one i heard heard the mock-up of and it it's just mind-blowing how cool that song's gonna be um just the the different levels and layers of of added instrumentation you know are just so cool how long were you guys rehearsing for it uh well we were supposed to have started rehearsals um uh we had a bunch scheduled in april because we had those shows in new york that got canceled um so brent was going to be out for that um so we had like I don't know, I think a, a week of rehearsals then. And then we were going to have um, rehearsals in May <clears throat> uh, with a, a couple shows to get warmed up, you know, little shows to get, because playing live is very different than rehearsing. So we had a, a bunch of stuff planned, but it never happened. Kind of leads into a question I wanted to ask you just about playing live or are there any songs that you've always wanted to play live that that you haven't maybe because the rest of the band didn't <laughs> didn't want to or anything like that yeah i guess the the one that i've always wanted to play is um is nothing off the first record it's it's one that was it was written while we were oh I, maybe it was completed the writing process was completed while we were recording that record. Um, so it just never got played live. Um, it's got a, not a, I mean, it's, it's more complex, the arrangement than um, the, than a lot of our other songs. So uh, it just would have required more like just memorization as opposed to just being able to get up and play um and just the way we rehearse songs that just doesn't that doesn't really fly um so yeah it'd be nice to do that one at some point right i've always wanted to hear valerie yum live but I, i'm pretty <laughs> sure i never will yeah i mean there's a lot of songs that are just studio creations that there's kind of no way to really do it without co completely reapproaching the song um and yeah they tend to just like never happen as opposed to the ones that are easy to do you know time's a blur but i saw that you posted <laughs> that you miss touring and like what do you miss about it in particular or where do you miss going um i miss going to europe um and australia i mean anywhere that's that's not here i've spent you know, most of my life in the United States. So I, I pref prefer going elsewhere. Um, um, though I'd be happy with doing a tour in the US. Um, but really just like playing music and traveling are my favorite things to do. So I'm not really getting to play music that much, you know, by myself is fine, but it's kind of meant to be for an audience. You know, it's the, rea the interaction with, with, you know, somebody listening which is um really great and then i don't know just because we've been a touring band for 25 years i have friends all over the world and i don't get to see them that often so yeah how are you guys staying in touch like do you do you have zoom meetings with with the band do you guys talk on the phone do you collaborate is there anything? Uh, just phone calls at the moment or texts um there's uh you know some some file sharing going on but um not a lot trying to wrap up a few um kind of little projects um and get them out so people have 
new things to listen to. Um, I guess before we dive into the next record, though that's definitely been started. Where where are you at the next record? <laughs> like, I don't know. There's two songs which are maybe pretty complete, and then a bunch of ideas. So things are not uh, um, not too far along. Well, as you can see, I have my background. You guys put out this this uh -huh. four hour um, ambient taffle music. Um, record would you call it a record what how would you describe it i don't know um to me it's it's just uh yeah it's um it was a, a failed attempt at something else for me i mean it's like i was really pushing for um the band to try and use different instruments to try and record or come up with ideas and um it sort of just turned into this long meandering, um, I don't know, you know, ambient thing uh, that wasn't a, you know, a, it wasn't a proper record. Um, it's perfect. It's perfect for background music. Um, and I don't know. So for me, it's a little frustrating um, because it's not what I wanted it to be, um, but it's still a cool thing. What, what did you want it to be? I wanted it to be a record, like, uh, like you know, a proper release um, to have songs, to things to be developed into songs. Right. Um, I don't even remember initially why I started or like the, why, I, like what my headspace was or, or whatever, but I'd like set up our whole stage with like drum machines and keyboards for everybody and then tried to you know just tried to get people interested in in doing something different um i don't know yeah i'm actually covering covering you up the, the way the image <laughs> you can just see your your yeah. hat but where was a picture taken uh that was uh taken by uh jared from the vacant lots um at the ace ace theater um ace hotel theater theater at the ace ah, whatever it's called in la um a year ago when we were on tour um he he told me to go sit out there because he reminded him of, of like a dylan photo i think and you being the only person on the cover is it is that sort of a nod that it, it was kind of no a project no not at all um it it maybe started as my idea. It definitely was not my project. Um, I think it's just that I'm alone, and that sort of fits into the title. So, right. Yeah. Well, so this is the second time that you've been on the the sole person on the cover of the Dandies <laughs> album, and uh, I did ask, do you have the jacket? Did you find? Do you still have the jacket from Thirteen Tales? I do. Yeah. Is it is it anywhere nearby? Yeah. Like yeah, I, I dug it out. Uh, that's there super you go. cool. Yeah. I uh, it got more patches over the like because this the photo that Brent took that um, ended up on the cover. Uh, I think that I think he took it in Spain when we were on tour in like '98. Um, and then, you know, this was an old jacket when I got it and, you know, it just kept getting more holes and I kept putting more patches on it. Um, yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. As you can see, there's, <laughs> there, there, <laughs> there she is. is so. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. awesome. Is it retired? Is it something that you ever break out anymore? Um, yeah, it's retired. <laughs> nice. Well, I appreciate I can't, you. I, I can't wear that anymore. Huh. Um, for one, it's got like, you know, the rebel flag on the front. I can't, can't wear that. Oh yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a little odd these days. Back then it was just like pop art or Southern rock to me. I didn't, didn't really even think about it that much. 
um, which, yeah, oh well, what are you going to do? Can you talk a little bit about Pete International Airport? I, uh, yeah, that's, um, um, it started with just because I had a bunch of, um, like riffs and ideas that, um, <clears throat> that Courtney wasn't interested in turning into songs. Um, and I had them, I had some of them like floating around for like years, like literally 10, 10 plus years. And so, um, I just started yeah, like, turning them into something, turning them into songs. Um, and ended up, um, just getting some, some other friends to play drums and, you know, a couple of people to play keys and just, you know, whatever I could, whatever I could get. And then Jason Adams, um, to, you know, helped like write lyrics and sang on all of them on the first record. But the initial, the inital idea was that, that there was going to have different people sing on it, but Jason was the only one that like really stepped up. Um, there's actually a song that I gave to Robert from Black Rebel that was supposed to have been on that record that ended up on the second record because it just took him a long time to finish. Right, so the, the first record, the record behind me came out in 2010, right? And Something like that, yeah. And there, it, the incarnation of the band included uh, Plucky from The Warlocks and many others and Colin from Brian Jonestown and... Uh -huh. and Jason was the singer in that. Um, let's see. Uh, and we had a number of different drummers um, over the years. Over the year, sorry. <laughs> that band exists. That form of the band existed for like like less than a year. But it was it was a pretty cool band. Um, I, I don't know. I wasn't used to being a band leader, and I don't know that I really handled it all that well. But what are you going to do? And then it took you another seven years to, to well, make another record. I, another well, I, wa I wasn't planning on ever making another record for it. I just like, I, I just couldn't picture having another band and it's like making another record without having a band didn't make any sense to me. Um, and then um, Jason Adams and I started doing like these little acoustic shows. They were like half covers. Um, and half like PIA songs. Um, and then, I don't know, all of a sudden he's like talking me into, you know, doing some more recording and, um, yeah, all of a sudden. And I had, of course, you know, I always have, I always had tons of little licks and guitar bits and ideas that, that I can turn into songs. You know, I just have to sit down and do it. What's exciting about it that are different than the dandies? Like when you're playing shows, is it nice? Do you enjoy being in smaller clubs? Uh, no, not necessarily. I my my favorite size venues are usually like, you know, Fillmore size, um, uh, or old theaters stuff like that. They're just just the way they look, the way they feel. Um, small clubs are fine too, but I, uh, the, um, the reason I like doing, um, PIA is just, you know, to have complete control over start to finish a whole, the whole process. Um, you know, it's, there's some collaboration going on, but, but ultimately I make the decisions, um, of how it's going to sound and, and what instrumentation and all that. So, yeah, I mean, it's tons of work. It's crazy amounts of work, but it's also, you know, very artistically satisfying. Yeah, I saw you guys a couple of years ago and I was looking forward to seeing you again. You're going to play, uh, I guess, a few shows leading up to Desert Stars, right? Uh-huh, yeah. Which those just got, that just got canceled again. So it's not, not happening in September anymore. I'm waiting to hear the re, the, the re reschedule. I know Tommy's uh, talked to me about like doing a, a streaming performance and kind of having a virtual festival 
or trying to do something like that. But yeah. Right. It doesn't really seem like shows are going to be happening in the very foreseeable future from what, from what I can tell. Yeah. It's, Unfortunately. It's, it looks a little grim. But what do you think the future of performing is going to be like? What do you think of all of these drive-in uh, concerts that... We'll see. I mean, <laughs> the problem is, is, I mean, it's only going to be like big shows. And so, you know, it's like, once again, the little guys get screwed. Um, and the you know alternative and independent music is going to suffer all the the independent venues are probably going to disappear um which leaves just you know live nation and uh all that nonsense yeah i, I worry I about them uh eating up all the clubs oh everything absolutely um i mean and it's the same thing with with you know small small like mom and pop stores of any kind like all the independent business companies that are doing all right now are like walmart and amazon and all that shit and everything else is like just gonna suffer yeah we're gonna wake up to everything being a, a fillmore and a chipotle i think so <laughs> I, I'm, you know ho hoping not but yeah and i don't know if you wanted to talk about black book guitars i I thought that, were you working for the guitar store or what, what, yeah, what were yeah. you doing over there? I was just working there. Um, it started, I just, I was out one night at a, at a show and I bumped into the owner, Nate, um, and <clears throat> I hadn't been to his shop yet. And um, I was just having to say something like, oh, my wife thinks I should, should open a guitar shop. And he goes, well, do you want to work at one to just try it out? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, why not? Um, I think that was that was before the the latest version of PIA had come come together. So I had time. I was just like, okay, I like guitars, and it was just an excuse to hang out at a guitar shop. So kind of did that. Instantly found out that I didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did. Um, and, and I don't know, I, I learned a lot. It was really cool. Saw a lot of guitars I never, ever thought I'd ever see. Well, you posted a lot of them. You posted a lot of cool guitars. It's funny. It's like working there, though, kind of cured me of my desire to have everything. Now, now I'm like, I look around and I think I've got too much and I keep trying to like figure out what I can let go of and but no I'm too attached to all of them so I feel like every guitar player has like one that got away and for me coincidentally oh, yeah. enough I had a 68 Fender Coronado 2 uh, black and it was like exactly what Courtney plays but it was all black uh -huh. and I, I pawned it and I was like paying like you know bad time in my life and like yeah. thought I was gonna get it back thought I was gonna get it back and like just just fucked up and and lost it and like so every time i see you guys and i see courtney's guitar i'm like god damn it like it, it hurts but <laughs> yeah uh, do, do you have one of those do you have like a guitar that um, was old or lost or was stolen that, that like still haunts you uh i mean you know it's like I've, I've sold a few things and you know you always regret it a little bit but i don't know i mean I don't, I don't need any of them. So any of the ones that are gone, so that's fine. Um, there's definitely some that I didn't get that I wish I had. Um, just mainly because I didn't know what they were at the time, or um, or just wasn't into those guitars at the time. I'm really kicking myself that I didn't like. Uh, get more jazz masters and jaguars when they were a lot cheaper um because those are the guitars i kind of go to more often these days but i have one of each and that's great i really don't need more but you know <laughs> it looks like you have a pretty good collection behind i've got you. i've I mean, got plenty i don't need any more um but i do i have my my new problem is is um 
there's a, a local builder named Saul Cole. Uh, there's the two that I have of his are back there. Um, they're the, the ones that I play the most like live these days. Um, and they're just so good. They just, they're so comfortable. Um, and I know like, you know, it's, it's a personal thing, like how, how you feel about a guitar, but, um, everybody I know that's played one kind of thinks the same thing. Like what, what kind of specs do you give them? Um, you know, the, the first one, um, I, I, I wanted a, essentially a baritone, um, and he had just like posted a picture of a guitar that he had made for somebody else, or I think it was somebody else. Um, and it had the kind of pickups I was kind of interested in in the moment. And, and I was like, I want that, but I want it black and I want, you know, a, it, a baritone. And that was pretty much the, the only like specs I gave him. And you also have a signature pedal. Um, I can't really take a lot of credit for that. I had an idea. Um, so Josh, um, the uh, owner of Maleco, um, who's a, a good friend of mine, he goes, let's do a signature pedal for you. What do you want? And at that point, I was just frustrated that everybody's like signature pedal was some like fuzz or or some, you know, version of a tube screamer just something not really all that interesting and um there was an effect or one of the patches on on an eventide um, harmonizer that we had at our studio it's called random stutter and i just always thought that was a cool a cool effect and i'd used it on a um on a remix and i tried to use it on a bunch of other things and i just said let's i want a pedal that does that and then they came up with the Charlie Foxtrot. Um, I named it and did the artwork, but besides the idea, um, all the hard work was, you know, there. That's that's on them. Are there any others in the works, or or was that? Yeah, was that there's it? A, no, there's another one um, that's all ready to go. There's just. Uh, there's nobody, uh, I guess, powder coating the, the boxes at the moment. Um, so just waiting on that. But there, yeah, there's another one. Um, uh, it's called the, the polyamorator. Um, nice. Yeah, it's kind of started. I, the idea, it was the same thing. I came up with an idea. Um, and they turned it into something that's just way, way more. Um, and it's really, really cool. Um, the idea was just I wanted an arpeggiator pedal, you know, something where you could pick the, the three notes that followed your initial note. Um, and it just turned into something so damn cool. Do you worry that not being, not touring regularly right now you'll like lose some of your notes on on how to make some of those sounds i watched a youtube thing with you where you know it's just like you going through your your rack and all your pedals and your board and it's just thinking like wow that's a lot to keep track of like do you actually like have notes or is it just sort of something where you just dial it in and kind of instinctually know what what you're supposed to do for each song um uh these days like i have a um i have a controller that does that changes all the things or it, it turns on and off all the pedals when they're supposed to be turned off on and off um so it's relatively easy it's just a matter of getting all those settings back in the right spot um but the the problem is uh i keep trying to improve on my pedal board board design, make it smaller, more compact, lighter weight. Um, so I'm constantly tearing it apart. Um, so there is no pedal board at the moment. <laughs> so as soon as, show, as soon as we have to start doing shows again, I'll have to rebuild it. And 
Um, and I don't know, who knows what I'll be, who knows what my ideas will be at that time. Could be dramatically different, which means that I have a lot more learning to do. Yeah, it's a time for that, right? You might be reborn after the coronavirus with a whole new sound. I've, it's quite possible. I mean, I don't know. I haven't really been spending a lot of time like messing around with pedals, though. It's more like getting ideas into the computer and creating songs out of them. Um, so there hasn't been a whole lot of just like tweaking. What's the songwriting process like with the dandies or, or how, when you're writing a song, like how do you know when a song is for one of your projects or, or Dandy Warhol's future um, project? Generally the stuff I come up with is not for the dandies. Um, every once in a while there's something which is sort of undeniably, okay, I'll give that a shot. But since I have to convince one of those guys to write lyrics and sing on something, um, they have to like it too. Um, so a lot of the stuff, like, you know, doesn't, doesn't get picked. Um, as far as like stuff that, uh, that they bring in, you know, generally it, it gets to a certain point where it needs Zia and me to play on it. And then we, we add our, our things and it slowly turns into a song. How's the process different with the Pete Inter International Airport? Um, generally that starts with some, something of some chord change that had come up with on an acoustic. Um, uh, something that's interesting enough to me to, to want to, you know, start recording. And it's just like, you know, start a new session, find some drum beats, just start building. Um, a lot of times it's, you know, I'll, I'll do as much as I can get frustrated and not go back to that session for years. Um, and every once in a while I'll go back, check on it, see if it's interesting or not. I've <laughs> literally you probably got, I don't know, 50, 70, like sessions of, of started songs. So most of them are garbage, but there's always like some little gem that'll go, oh, hey, that's all right. And, you know, it'll all of a sudden be on the next record. And the current band, it's Daniel, Tara, Jason and your, yourself? Mm-hmm, yeah. And they all live on the they're coast, all right? yeah they're all in brooklyn it's a little difficult but um at least there's only one person like flying across the country you know to go rehearse or work on stuff but um i mean recording these days is all on a computer and you don't need a studio you know you can it's easy to do stuff so it's what we do it's how we work how did you get hooked up with all of them originally? Um, Daniel, I've, I've known for years. I had my, my first sort of post or first side project, you know, outside or band outside of the dandies with him. Um, I don't God, when was that back in like, I think we started working first started writing songs like, I don't know, 2003, something like that. Yeah, somewhere around that. Um, and uh, Jason Russo, I met when uh, when the Rebel Drones played a show with his band in Portland. Um, uh, played with Hopewell. Um, and I I liked their show. I I met Jason. We hung out. I don't know. We, it was cool. Um, I had him, uh, had them open for the dandies on part of a tour after that. And we just always stayed in touch. And then when it came to sort of asking people to, to sing on the, the last PIA record, um, you know, 
I asked him. And he ended up doing two. What inspired the remix album? Probably, um, uh, I guess, what are, probably Primal Screams, like Echo Deck, which is their sort of dub remix of Vanishing Point, um, which was kind of a really big record for me. And I just like that idea. I've always liked remixes. Um, you know, the ones that aren't just a, you know, a fucking dance beat. You know, it's like something that really takes something farther or or just takes one aspect of, of the song and just makes that the focus. Um, so, I don't know. I've been doing remixes for people for years and just wanted wanted other people to do remixes of these songs and, you know, not necessarily people that do remixes, um, but just get other people's interpretations of the song, so. Yeah, came together. There's some amazing stuff on it too. Just fantastic, like. And it's version. it's just being released um, now, right? Or in I, the... yeah, I mean it's it's been available um, for a year, but it's gonna be, there's gonna have a physical release um, like really soon. Um, like couple minutes ago I got a pile of texts from from Mike Nesbitt who's putting it out um I think a, a, about it or some aspect of the release so um yeah all the details are coming together it's a little harder uh these days to get everything you know in one place at the right time but we're making it work posted on the Dandy Warhol's fan group what strings does he use? <laughs> well, there's somebody answered it. Most of it, the, I I use uh, Ernie Ernie Ball skinny top heavy bottoms on on pretty much everything, um, except the the bass six, which I have the the Gabriel Tenorio strings. Um, uh, right. They're I just whatever I ended up with on that originally I have to have custom made now so <laughs> favorite strain of weed yeah I don't smoke grass so that's everybody else in the band <laughs> if I'm not mistaken you've been been sober for for a long time is that something that you talk about or want to talk about I mean, it's just something i i you know I, I did it um i quit drinking first like back actually in in 97 right right when come down came out um and i was just gonna quit for a year um it's a, an agreement i made with my girlfriend at, at the time to get her to move back in because um i don't know i was I don't know. I was, I was headed down. I don't know. I was a super fun drunk. Let's put it that way. Um, and enjoyed being a super fun drunk. Um, but then after a year of being sober, um, just kind of liked myself better. Um, I lost a bunch of weight, just felt, felt better all around. Um, was definitely more productive, um, more focused on, on things that, were a little bit more important um you know i had to i had to face some of the things that i was um avoiding and so that was definitely an improvement um quitting everything else came later slowly but you know quit smoking quit quit doing drugs so still say i'll do mushrooms or acid but I don't know. I just don't have the time. So I don't know. Maybe one day. Do you have any sort of practice, spiritual practice or otherwise it's helped you through this time or? Music. Um, I used to do a lot of yoga. Um, now I do a little bit of yoga. Um, but it's music is really kind of the thing I do the most of that's I think is spiritual as well as um, as work, you know. 
So again, want to smoke, want to light this bowl. Can you hook me up with Zia? Nope. Do you like effects pedals? Yes. <laughs> what guitar he likes best and favorite BJM song just because I'd like to know. <laughs> um, favorite guitar is definitely my, my Saul Cole, um, uh, what does he call them, Super Cubs. Um, there's just something about the shape um the i don't know just everything about it it's just perfect it's really it's thin it's lightweight it it's well balanced it plays really well it sounds really good um that's and it, yeah and it looks really really cool so that's that's favorite guitar um favorite jonestown song um I'm gonna have to look it up. It's uh, off an album that came out a couple couple years back. Did you get sick of of talking about the Brian Jonestown massacre? Uh, <clears throat> no, I I just I just hope that that one day I could talk about it enough that the whole like uh, rivalry bullshit will go away, but it won't. Um. Oh, the record's called Don't Get Lost. I suppose like things like Servo, um, Anemone is amazing. Um, I, there's so many good ones. Um, but I really like the Don't Get Lost record. Um, it's just, it seemed like, and it, and it was, uh, it's like really inspiring, like, cause I was just, I think I was in the process of finishing my record um, or getting close to mixing or something um, when I heard that. And um, it's part of the reason I approached Anton about him releasing that, my record. Um, it's because I, I don't know, thought he, I like, I thought he would, I thought it would fit in kind of a little bit more with what he was doing. I was going to try and avoid you know, Dig and BJM all, all together just because, you know, just because there's, there's no avoiding it. It's, it's kind of whatever. It's just one of those things. I don't know how to, how to say it, but I guess I was surprised at the kind of response that it got. People really like just reacted to it and it became like this kind of modern rock and roll classic, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good story. And if I wasn't in one of the, if I wasn't part of it and, um, I, I would probably like it a lot better, but I didn't happen in that order, you know, that she, that Andy used, you know, footage of stuff to, to create a story that, you know, makes a good movie or an entertaining movie. Um, there's a lot of interesting backstage, you know, behind the scenes stuff, but I, I really wish there was more about music. I mean, both, both us and Jonestown thought it was going to be about music, not, not the rivalry, the made up rivalry. I haven't seen it for years. Like, I think, oh, I don't even know. Like sometime around when it was, was released, I think was the last time I saw it. So, I just don't want my memories to be co-opted by that 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 film, because um, that happens so easily. Like, you, all of a sudden, your your memories just become the film, and it's not that. It's not that way. It's not supposed to be that way. I mean, both both of you guys, I think, benefited a lot for in. I mean, in some ways, <laughs> maybe in other other ways, well, not so much. We we suffered at first um for sure i mean ultimately like having a film that you're in um can only bring people to you know or bring you to their attention um so i think it it's definitely you know good in that sense but but the fact that most people who seem to it seems that most people who watch it feel like they have to pick one band or the other to like they can't like both bands and there's just some absurd, absurd things that have happened because of that. Um, we played a Paris psych festival a, a 
few years ago and some people Jonestown wasn't playing it um but some some people decided to hang a banner off the balcony that says we like Jonestown better great so you're entitled to like that why do you feel like you have to share just some really weird stuff but whatever did you guys ever talk about touring together or was that like too cheesy so it's it really comes down to money um and the problem is is we both kind of have the same audience so if we join up together to do a show we're both playing to the same amount of people that we normally would play to and splitting the same amount of money that we would normally just get for ourselves so it just doesn't make financial sense, unfortunately. Um, I'd love to play shows with them. I, th I think that would be a great thing to do, but unfortunately, I, it just doesn't make sense for either one of us. We keep trying to. There's always talk of doing something. There was some ideas of doing some stuff in Australia a, a few years. See, and God, maybe it was only a year ago we were talking about it. I don't know. Not that long ago, but it comes up all the time. I'm sure it does, but that makes sense. Yeah. It's a shame because it's like, it would be, it'd be great. We played shows in the past. It was so much fun. Seems like it would, that would be a fun show. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll go back to the questions here. How awesome is it to be you all the time, but especially on stage? That's the only time it's really awesome to be me. <laughs> How many times a day do you pick up four leaf clovers <laughs> while just walking around? Um, I haven't found any this year, um, but I find them quite often. Here's a good one. Rick Smith asks, who plays more lead on the songs, you or Courtney? Um, it started Courtney um, would do most of the leads. Um, and then it started switching that I would play a lot of the leads. Um, uh, even if he played them on the record, I would end up playing them live. Um, so he could just focus on singing. And, um, and now I guess I kind of do most of them live, I guess. I don't know. We don't have a lot of leads. <laughs> you have a favorite lead do you have a, or favorite song? to play um mohammed is the one i always say it's just um it's just one of the ones that's um i don't know it's just really it's pretty and it's kind of dark and yeah it's cool i like i like playing i love you and hold me up too live just because they're the ones that have more of a free form ending which is when we get to experiment and uh, try new things and sometimes fail fail horribly but um it's exciting yeah those are my favorite dandy warhol show moments um yeah. also the last couple of years um pope reverend jim <laughs> that looks like it's a lot of fun to play you do that twangy thing that's like yeah yeah do the the Dwayne eddy trick um yeah i don't know we stopped doing that and i can't remember why that was that was definitely fun i think there are a few more if you're if you're up for them sure how do you turn yourself invisible magic hats oh yeah is there any story with you do like hats yeah anything to say about your hats it's no, <laughs> I just like hats. It's all stuff to hide behind on stage, pretty much. It's either hair, hats, sunglasses. Uh, yeah, whatever it takes. Which guitar players are your favorites? To you, like, what makes a great guitar player? Yeah, it's, that's a tricky one. I mean, my favorite guitar players aren't like the guys that can play you know super fast most of them tend not to um 
you know, I was, it was always Keith Richards and, and David Gilmore, you know, kind of the first people. Um, and then it was more, more sonically experimental stuff like, um, I don't know, uh, Daniel Ash and, and, you know, Jesus and Mary Chain, Kevin Shields, that kind of stuff, or it was just more, more about sound as opposed to chops. And, you know, Peter Hayes is one of my favorites. It's kind of a, a kind of that perfect combination of, of, uh, like traditional rock and then like effects. If he offers guitar lessons, do you ever give guitar lessons? <laughs> um, I am I'm giving one person guitar lessons, and 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 that's enough. I'm not a teacher. I am absolutely not a, a, a definitely not a guitar teacher. I barely know what I'm doing, like let alone how to express it in a, in a way to tell somebody else. Um, but I am giving one person guitar lessons. Do you have any tips on if, if someone is wanting to learn guitar, get better at guitar, where to start or, or what to focus on? Theory or I don't know anything. Um, I think it's different for everybody. I mean, you have to find what it is you want to do um, and learn, the, learn something that keeps you doing it because it's not easy um, at first but you don't have to know a lot to, for it to be something that's like incredibly satisfying. Um, but it's essentially, I don't know. There's, there's some, there's some technique stuff that I could teach somebody, but um, as far as like, you know, it's going to be up to whoever, whoever it is to, to figure out what it is that makes them want to keep learning. Right. There were a lot of comments. <laughs> Who are the guest singers? Um, guest singers on the new, the new PIA record. Um, well, Jason Adams is singing on a couple. Daniel Sparks is probably singing on some. I'm expecting something from Jason Russo and Tara. Lisa, who sang on uh, Senorita. Um, her band's the Dark Dark Horses. Uh, she's singing on one, possibly two, and then um, uh, there's a guy named Alexander Hackett, whose band is called Pang Attack. Um, I've never met him, uh, but I really, really like his his music. He's got a great voice. Um, he has finished one song for me already, um, and possibly doing two more um still hoping that uh that robert will sing on a song i sent him one and then there's a bunch of stuff that i don't have singers yet have you ever sliced your hand open doing the boys better <laughs> <laughs> um yes i do i used to injure myself all the time um, like the beginning of every tour, I would scrape like a knuckle and it would bleed. Um, and then the next show I would just peel that scab right off and just bleed. And it just would go on for like, until, I don't know, it'd go on for about a week and then I wouldn't hit my knuckles ever again. Um, now I don't do it very, every, like I don't hit my hand that often, but every once in a while I do. Um, I still have blood all over all over one guitar uh, from from one of those accidents. <laughs> but um, that uh, when we were doing Boys Better, like when we first first were doing it, um, um, that part of the song it was just like every show. It's like it just my movements got a little bit bigger until finally, like one time, it was like, oh, holy shit. I just did the windmill. Um, it wasn't something I was really planning on. It just sort of, it just happened. And then from that That's point on, it just feels weird if I don't do it, so. Um, do you want some tater tots? Cause I did, he said no. Does that mean anything to you? I don't know what that means. No, 
Uh, can I come to the auditorium for a session, please, immediately? Do you, um, or have you been going to the auditorium, or, or is that strictly no. quarantine? Like, just um, stay. No, it's just, um, it's just, for me, it's like so much easier to work here. So I do pretty much all my recording here. Um, I haven't needed to mix anything. And I usually go down there to mix. Um, I don't like mixing, but when I have to, I go down there. Um, more plugins, more more gear, better monitors. So, uh, just wanted to throw out there. You know, we've lost a lot of amazing people in the last uh, couple of months. Mm -hmm. Aside from Little Richard, there's uh, Genesis Peorage, David Roback. Yeah. Florian Schneider and Dave Greenfield of the Stranglers and I was just wondering if, if you had any if you were particularly close um, with any of those people and if you had any stories about about them or just Genesis is the only one of those people that I, I had met um, he he was an early like uh, support not I don't know he he liked what what we were doing, he was excited about us, um, um, and like hung around a little bit. So we used to see him a bunch. The the first time I met him, um, we were doing a show in um, San Francisco with with Jonestown. We were playing upstairs, and Pigface was playing downstairs in the big room. And I guess Genesis was a part of Pigface at that point. Um, I've heard about that show. I, I heard he was <laughs> floating around in the audience on like a big, you know, inflatable duck or something. Okay. I didn't see the show, so I have no idea. But I, I remember like, like, I think after our show or something, like, like standing around, I think waiting for Jonestown to play. And he came up to us and it was i don't know he was frightening looking you know to us you know it's like dreadlocks and i don't know it, it felt like he had sharp teeth and i don't know but he was just so nice and friendly and just completely awesome um but yeah yeah i, I lost touch um over the years but so, I mean, I don't know. Can't, seems like you can't keep up with everybody. I guess for the future, what, are you waiting to see if um, you're tentatively uh, still playing shows with Pete International Airport in the fall? No, no, with, with Dandies in the fall. Um, there's the, the PIA stuff. I, I don't know when that's happening again yet. Um, we'll see. There's trying to do some, come up with some streaming ideas, but um, yeah, it's gonna, I wanna do something different. So I'm trying to figure out how I can do some programming, like modular modular drums and synth programming to, to play along to. So it's not just me with an acoustic guitar or something. Try and try and do this in an interesting way. Yeah. I'm looking looking forward to seeing whatever comes out of of your quarantine time. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely um, yeah, there's going to be getting a lot closer with the next PIA record. the The Jason Adams record is going to be amazing. Um, super fun working on it. Um, the new walls of data the the few songs that we've got done are, are really cool um yeah and the jason adams record's not done yet but uh should check out his other band uh mother mariposa um or daydream machine or the upside down those are all all his past bands um mother mariposa is still up and running uh, they're all like really cool well, cool. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for being here with me instead of uh, with the Portland <laughs> Symphony Orchestra, uh, you know. Yeah, it is what it is. So thanks, man. I'll be in touch. Yeah. And I'll All right. Nice know. one. Thank you.